Hi, my name is Richard. I'm a software engineer at AnyScale. Previously, I was a PhD student at UC Berkeley working on machine learning systems and cloud computing. During my PhD, I primarily worked on Ray, which is a distributed computing library uh, in Python targeting AI applications. And so today, I'll be talking to you about hyperparameter tuning. For this talk, we'll begin by motivating the importance and highlighting the complexity of tuning model hyperparameters. We'll overview some of the state-of-the-art techniques for optimizing these parameters. And finally, I'll talk about RayTune, a Python library for simplifying and scaling hyperparameter tuning. At the end of this talk, you should be able to, uh, to leverage new hyperparameter algorithms and frameworks uh, to accelerate your machine learning workflow. Let's begin with some context about machine learning today. Machine learning, specifically deep learning, is experiencing rapid growth and adoption. This is happening not only in academia, but also in industry, where more and more applications such as speech recognition and autonomous vehicles are leveraging deep learning. Despite this rapid growth and adoption, all deep learning practitioners know about one dirty secret, and that is the reliance and need for hyperparameter tuning. Let's give an example. Um, I'll talk quickly about convolutional neural networks. These neural networks are very powerful and attributed to many of the recent advances in computer vision. Here on the screen, we have one of the original convolutional neural network designs by Jan de Kuhn. On the bottom, we have a more modern neural network design called AlexNet, also a convolutional neural network. This was developed after 20 years of research. And what's interesting is that the basic idea over the last 20 years have remained largely unchanged. Over the last 20 years, we've actually simply just modified uh, the shape of the neural network and size of each layers. And as a result, we have this new wave of deep learning research um, that is so active today. These hyperparameters can clearly make a huge difference in the performance of these models. Now, what's making matters worse is actually two common trends that we're seeing. Uh, the first one is that models are getting larger and larger, with the most recent OpenAI GPT-3 model containing nearly 200 billion parameters. These state-of-the-art models are not only larger, but they're also more complex. So as you see on the screen, we have another famous uh, recent language model containing over a dozen hyperparameters that you have to tune. This means that selecting the right hyperparameters is going to actually simply take a long time and compute a lot of resources, con consume a lot of resources. So we arrive at the main problem of hyperparameter tuning which is not simply just to choose how to choose these hyperparameters, but rather how do we choose these parameters both efficiently and quickly. And I propose that we can address this problem with a two-pronged approach. First, we can leverage advanced algorithms to navigate the search space. And second, we can use cutting edge software to better leverage our compute resources. Today, I'll now, I'll now cover five different types of hyperparameter tuning techniques. This includes grid search, random search, Bayesian optimization, bandit-based techniques, and genetic-based techniques such as population-based training. Some of these techniques are applicable to many traditional machine learning methods, and some of these techniques are, have much more significance and importance in the regime of deep learning. For the sake of uh, clarity, I'll be using the word trial quite often in the rest of this talk. Uh, trial in, in hyperparameter tuning literature typically means one configuration evaluation. So essentially one sample of the hyperparameters that, um, that we plan to evaluate. So I want to start with the most simple hyperparameter tuning technique of them all, which is grid search. This is a very simple and very standard technique for evaluating multiple hyperparameters. Even though this may seem naive, um, there, there are a couple benefits to doing grid search. 
The first is that it's easily parallelizable. Uh, the second is that it gives you a lot of insight into how hyperparameters are affecting each other. So specifically on the screen, we have some pseudocode. We're essentially doing a cross product across all the different um, listed samples or listed hyperparameter values for each of the different hyperparameter dimensions. Now, the problem is that if you're trying to simply tune or optimize your model over your hyperparameter space, say you want to get the highest score or the highest accuracy or the best, um, the best simulated reward, um, this technique of grid search can be very inefficient. And we can see a graphical representation of how grid search fails to be a good tuning method. See on the left hand side, uh, the grid fully completely misses the optimal point of the important hyperparameter, which is on the top side of the chart. Um, however, on the right hand side, we have another technique, random search. Random search is able to provide um, good coverage over the hyperparameter space, allowing us to, to actually reach the optimal point of this important parameter. And in exchange for uh, ability to have a structural analysis of random of, of the hyperparameter tuning grid. So random search is just what it sounds like. You have different distributions for each hyperparameter tuning value, and you sample parameters from these distributions over and over again, eventually finding the best model. Again, there's a couple benefits to doing random search. One is that it's easily parallelizable because each evaluation is independent of each other. And second, turns out in high dimensions, random search is actually very hard to beat. So again, one problem with uh, random search is that you lose the ability to have an explainable hyperparameter tuning space that you've evaluated. And second, there's a couple things that we can do better since random search is actually quite uh, ineffective and expensive or inefficient and expensive. After all, you're trying things at random. So what if we used prior information from evaluated training runs to guide our tuning process? Well, this is what Bayesian optimization and other model-based optimization processes do. I'll spare you the details and the mathematics of uh, Bayesian optimization. And I'll just simply provide a very high level overview of how this sort of model-based optimization works. So uh, we essentially construct a optimizer, optimizer that is aware of the search space. So in this particular example, we have a range for um, learning rate to be from negative or from 0 0.1, 0 0.01 to 0 0.1. And we have a range of different, uh, say, neural network layers that we want to evaluate from two to five. So every time we we uh, evaluate a new point, we will first sample um, uh, a point from the given search space. And this particular sample will be guided and selected by this given optimizer object. The optimizer object um, so now provides the sample to you. The, we will evaluate the sample by training our model and returning a final score, such as a validation, accuracy, or loss. Then the optimizer will use that new information, that new final score, that new validation accuracy to generate a new point um, to sample within the space. Ultimately, it aims to optimize this given validation accuracy. So there's a lot of open source libraries that, that provide great implementations for Bayesian optimization and sort of model-based optimization techniques. Uh, most famously, you might have heard of Hyperopt, which is a yet another model-based optimization library. As you can see, Bayesian optimization is inherently sequential uh, and utilizes prior information. Another often ignored fact is that Bayesian optimization is to some extent parallelizable. You can sample multiple points at once and Oftentimes, it's quite beneficial because you can better explore the search space without being biased by the optimizer. Um, however, the, again, the, the 
because it's inherently sequential, the benefit of parallelization uh, decreases significantly as you add more workers. So, so now that we understand um, Bayesian optimization, there's actually still room to do better. So if we actually take a look at uh, a typical graph of multiple training accuracies, there's a lot of models that are simply bad performers. Now you might naturally ask, why bother wasting resources on these trials that aren't, simple, aren't simply going to be good? Well, there's a hyperparameter tuning, that, tuning technique that addresses this precisely. And that is uh, typically, most famously known as hyperband. Hyperband and its variants, including ASHA, successive halving, um, etc., is uh, these these families of this family of algorithms uh, are are essentially early stopping algorithms. What does that mean? It means that these algorithms aim to allocate resources to better performing trials and reduce the number of uh, resources or the time spent evaluating bad trials. So let's quickly walk through some pseudocode. Um, as similar to random search, we'll sample from the hyperparameter search space and we'll evaluate this particular uh, trial or model given these, this hyperparameter sample for a max number of epochs or steps or iterations. So every step we will, um, we will keep continue training this trial and at a certain point, and this is a user specified point, um, the trial will be compared to other relative perform other trials that have reached this certain uh, point. So let's say we can say something like the cutoff uh, is equal to five epics. At five epics, all the trials will be compared against each other. And if a particular trial is in the top fraction of trials at five epics, then um, we will continue training that trial. Otherwise, we're going to uh, pause it and release the resources allocated to that particular trial in view of another, perhaps more promising trial to, to take, make use of these resources. So essentially what's happening is if you're not performing very well, uh, the we're not going to evaluate anymore and if you're evaluating if you're performing very well you're, you're you know a very promising hyperparameter configuration then we're going to keep evaluating you until the end and um, there have been recent advances that have made hyperband capable of being combined with bayesian optimization hyperband is also nice because it's easily parallelizable which actually improves its efficiency but there's actually some more room for improvement. Turns out in deep learning, hyperparameter schedules matter a lot. This means that we can uh, change the hyperparameter value during training, and it actually affects our performance dramatically. As you can see on the screen, there is a, a common neural network called a ResNet that is being trained, and this is one of the standard computer vision models um, today. You'll notice that after a certain uh, number of steps, um, the training plateaus, but after we change the learning rate, so say we reduce the learning rate in the middle of training, um, we actually see a massive increase in performance. So this is now a standard technique that everyone uses and it's typically required uh, to do the sort of dynamic hyperparameter tuning uh, in order to get state-of-the-art results. So there's a technique from Google DeepMind that is able to address this particular issue. The main idea of this particular technique, which is called population-based training, is that uh, we will evaluate a number of samples or trials in parallel. And for the, the lowest performing trials, um, we will terminate them similar to these early stopping methods. But for the best ones, um, we will continue training them and we will use them as templates to replace these terminated low performers. 
when these templates are are used, they're essentially cloned and the hyperparameters are mutated, so they are perturbed in some way. This effectively allows us to search over hyperparameter tuning schedules and is also efficient in that it terminates bad performers. So here's a walkthrough of population-based training. We'll start off with four different um, trials. Say we have four different values of learning rate from 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. Um, we'll train them for say one epic. And at one epic, we will have a, a, um, a evaluation across all of the given trials that are running. So let's say it turns out 0 0.4 is the worst performing trial of the four. So what's PBT, uh, population-based training, also known as PBT, is going to do is going to terminate um, this 0 0.4 trial. And let's also say that 0 0.1 is the best trial of the four. So then we're going to clone 0 0.1 and perturb the value of its hyperparameters a little bit. So let's say it's perturbed to 0 0.15. So now uh, we will continue training for another epic and we'll repeat this process again. So we'll terminate the lowest performer and mutate the best performer, uh, say this is 0 0.3 this time, and so on and so forth. Notice that as we perturb the model over and over again, we're able to identify or actually just uh, evaluate different hyperparameter tuning schedules across training. Obviously this isn't perfect, but it actually performs quite well in practice. DeepMind ran this technique when they published this uh, PBT work uh, over multiple previously published algorithms. They found that across the board, PBT was able to provide a non-trivial performance increase uh, over the state of the art. Now it's used in various different applications in Google, such as uh, self-driving cars. There was a recent article by Waymo saying that they were leveraging PBT to train their self-driving car algorithms and also um, other Google Brain efforts um, used for say advertising or internal use cases. So now that we have an overview of all the different hyperparameter tuning algorithms, um, I'd like to give some tips for effective hyperparameter tuning um, in, in daily work. So I was reading a blog post the other day about hyperparameter tuning and the author brought up a pitfall um, for, common, for a common hyperparameter tuning pitfall, which was that practitioners were not tuning enough hyperparameters. In fact, this blog post recommended that, that practitioners tune all of the hyperparameters of your model at the same time. And actually, in practice, I've actually seen quite a few people do this um, over, and it seems quite intuitive because you might want to uh, capture all the different dependencies and there might be some complex interactions between different hyperparameters. But actually, um, in practice, this is quite inefficient. Why? Well. Turns out there, in modern deep learning models as presented in the beginning of the talk, there are dozens of hyperparameters that you can tune in modern machine learning models, right? And so we have here, again, this very famous language model, Roberta, and it has more than a dozen um, hyperparameters. However, only some of them really matter. Most of them don't really affect performance and many of the defaults are quite robust across uh, different configurations. So what that means is that actually there's only a select few that really matter and hyperparameter tuning effectively has a low effective dimensionality. So this means that you want to effectively choose which hyperparameters you're searching over. And again, choosing the hyperparameter space itself is an important decision. So you might be asking yourself, okay, well, I know that there has to be one of these or two or three of these things that are incredibly important, but I have a list of 20. How do I choose my hyperparameter space? How do I choose the right hyperparameters to evaluate in the first place? Well, 
My second tip for you is that you should make use of the available tools for visualizing and understanding your hyperparameter tuning landscape. A common tool that uh, researchers use, um, especially at well, well-serviced places such as Google, is this parallel coordinates tool. It helps you visualize multiple dimensions uh, at once, which is hard to do in, say, a 2D or 3D graph. Um, so here is a, a graphical representation of how that might work. Typically, these uh, parallel coordinate tools are, allow you to filter out particular runs and identify different relationships between uh, multiple hyperparameters at once. This, in turn, is allow allows you to uh, better inform how you uh, structure your search in this sort of iterative process. So um, there's many tools that, that provide this sort of tuning um, visualization techniques, such as TensorBoard, Weights and Biases, Cave, and Neptune. Um, I'm, pre I'm fairly certain that if you choose any one of them, you'll be, you'll be able to leverage m much of the same uh, useful functionality, and it will help you a lot by, by better understanding uh, what is your hyperparameter tuning landscape looking like. Finally, a common pitfall uh, is that the hyperparameters chosen through the tuning process don't actually perform well in practice. And the tip here is that one should always remember that hyperparameter optimization is uh, at heart a optimization problem. And the goal of the user should be to uh, provide some nice inputs to the optimizer so that it can optimize over a, a smoother landscape. Typically in something like reinforcement learning or even modern language training uh, today, there are metrics that people use to evaluate the goodness of the model, but those are very noisy. Um, the variance on a lot of deep reinforcement learning papers, uh, the results are, are very hard to, 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 uh, to actually see what's going on because the variance is so high. So there's multiple tips that you can do and, and you will have to either engineer it yourself or look for a framework that does this for you. But uh, typical things that you would want to do to reduce overfitting and, and denoise your, your um, optimization inputs include making sure you do cross-validation, uh, making sure you evaluate the same hyperparameter across multiple seeds, and then also look at uh, consider looking at different metrics in addition to accuracy, uh, such as the gap between validation and training, or model entropy, or even training versus validation loss. So those are my three tips on how you can practically improve your hyperparameter tuning process. And now let's talk about how you can quickly tune your hyperparameters by leveraging underlying resources or uh, given compute clusters. I'll talk about RayTune, which is a scalable hyperparameter tuning um, developed uh, now primarily at any scale, but previously at UC Berkeley. And um, RayTune is a scalable hyperparameter tuning library that works with uh, any machine learning framework. For some quick context, RayTune is built on top of Ray. Ray is both a framework for distributed Python, but also contains an ecosystem of specific use cases, such as hyperparameter tuning, as we're talking about today, but also distributed training and deep reinforcement learning and model serving. So RayTune specifically is a library that handles the execution of hyperparameter search. It provides hooks to plug in different hyperparameter search algorithms and automatically handles the parallelism and scaling for you. Why is Tune special? Well, Tune is built with deep learning as a priority. Now, what does that mean specifically? Tune is built so that you can utilize and spread your training and tuning across multiple GPUs across your cluster. It also allows users to tune models with any machine learning framework. And most importantly, Tune allows you to run hyperparameter tuning at any scale. So you can go from running on a single process to running across a bunch of GPUs 
to run across multiple nodes all without changing your code. As mentioned today, hyperparameter tuning algorithms are very important to leverage. So Tune offers, RayTune offers uh, many algorithms to optimize your hyperparameter search, including all of the algorithms mentioned today. Tune also uh, integrates with a lot of open source hyperparameter tuning libraries. So these optimization libraries such as Hyperopt or recent, uh, this recent library called Axe from Facebook, in addition to services such as Sigopt um, and, and others. So what this means is that you can transparently scale out this optimization process that these libraries offer across multiple cores and multiple nodes. Let's quickly walk through the Tune API so you can have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So we'll start off with a very simple model training function. This is something you might construct in, in PyTorch, and essentially you have a model and you can train it for one epoch uh, at a time, and then you can do multiple epochs to eventually converge to a particular loss. In order to use Tune, you can simply add a single line, which uh, uses the Tune's reporting API uh, for the training function to log the loss. So this informs Tune of the current performance of the model, and it's a very lightweight um, uh, uh, interface. So in order to run a hyperparameter search, all you need to do is take that function that you've defined with this reporter call with inside, and pass it to tune.run. So here in this particular example, tune.run is going to evaluate this train model function that we've defined using this configuration, uh, this hyperparameter, essentially trial of uh, learning rate equals 0 0.1. To perform a large scale search, say if you had a large compute cluster, all you needed to do was is add an argument um, this increases the number of samples that you're going to um, take from the, the training distribution, and specifically we're setting that to 100. The parallelism uh, that Tune will operate at is determined by the size of your cluster, so it automatically uh, leverages all the cores available to you um, in, in your particular cluster. Specifically for this, we're using a random search and you can see Tune provides a simple API for specifying a search space. Oftentimes, you'll want to leverage a GPU and in PyTorch and other distributed training frameworks or hyper, uh, model tuning frameworks, uh, you'll be forced to handle ugly environment variables and manual device placement and such. However, Tune uh, is you know built for deep learning, so it will automatically set your environment variables, um, isolate your training jobs across multiple GPUs, allowing you to parallelize your search uh, even across you know multiple machines without ever setting these uh, environment variables by hand. Through this narrow, very narrow API, essentially two two different code. Um, two different API calls, Tune exposes a variety of features, including automatic checkpointing and specifying different tuning algorithms. So, and as we mentioned above, it's incredibly important to analyze your hyperparameter tuning run afterwards. So if you wanted, you can provide, uh, you can capture the, the, the results in a data frame, um, which is provided to you automatically so that you can analyze different training results across all the different models that you've trained and all the different hyperparameters that you evaluated. In addition, uh, we talked about the importance of visualization. So uh, Tune automatically generates TensorBoard files so that you can visualize and understand your training with uh, different scalar graphs and parallel coordinate plots. So at a very high level, um, what RayTune allows you to do is it aims, you, aims to simplify um, your machine learning workflow so you don't need to do all this busy work yourself. If you're interested in learning more about RayTune, you can check out the RayTune documentation where you will find tutorials, uh, walkthroughs for integrating Tune into uh, multiple machine learning libraries, uh, 
and examples for using different features. Um, if you have any questions or you want to get more involved, feel free to head over to our GitHub where we have a large thriving community um, with over 300 different contributors and responsive developers uh, who are more than happy to help you out. So to recap, uh, in this talk we motivated the importance of and highlighted the complexity of hyperparameter tuning. We overviewed some of the state-of-the-art result uh, techniques for tuning hyperparameters. And finally, we talked about RayTune, which is a library built on top of Ray to simplify and scale hyperparameter tuning. Hopefully, the uh, provided information in this talk will help accelerate your existing machine learning workflow. As a final um, call out, uh, we are hosting a Ray Summit, which is going to be a free online conference um, on September 30th to October 1st, uh, covering workshops and different tutorials and keynotes uh, on all sorts of different scalable machine learning and scalable Python topics. So if you're interested, please check out uh, raysummit.org. Thanks for listening. Um, if you have any questions, you're, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or, or at my email and happy to take any questions now. Thanks.